Hey guys, Abel here, and after last week's kind of one-off episode, which was on a deeper and perhaps weirder topic, this week I'd like to talk about some training and diet stuff again. And namely, I'd like to talk about perma bulking and raise the question whether perhaps there is a point in perma bulking, not dirty bulking, which are two different things in my head at least. So in my dictionary, Dirty bulking refers to just eating everything in sight and quickly putting on a ton of body fat, justified by the thought process that this will lead to increased muscle growth. Perma bulking, on the other hand, in my mind at least, refers to just bulking for a very long period of time and not cutting off your bulk at the point when it seems like you have already put on a fair amount of body fat, but instead keep going in the hopes of putting on more muscle by staying in a hypercaloric condition longer. And this latter one is the one I want to address in this episode. Now, some housekeeping again. What inspired this episode was a recent discussion between Menno Henselmans and Jacob Skepis on the JPS Health and Fitness YouTube channel, which was a really cool one. I would recommend that you guys check that one out. And it also initiated some cool discussion in the Sustainable Self-Development Facebook group. So in this episode, I would like to talk about this topic of permabulking and the potential benefits thereof and elaborate on my thoughts on the matter. So big picture first, as you may know, muscle cells are one of the few types of cells in the body which have multiple nuclei. So the nucleus of any given cell, at least to those cells that do have a nucleus, is one of the most important part of the cell, which contains the genetic material of the cell. I just said cell way too many times, didn't I? And muscle cells can also acquire more of these nuclei when they are exposed to heavy training. Now, what happens in theory, at least, is that each of these nuclei have a given potential to basically initiate and contribute to the growth and maintenance of new muscle tissue. And outside of that, they can't contribute to any more growth. So if you want to keep growing, after some point, it would be important to do things that would increase the number of these myonuclei. And as you become more advanced and you approach your genetic ceiling, it seems like this process of acquiring new muscle nuclei is becoming harder and harder. And that's why there is some interesting talk about how you can potentially do things in your training to acquire more of these muscle nuclei. One thing, for example, is to periodically do some muscle damaging training techniques or one thing we are doing in the SSD training system is having a period of strategic deconditioning, which was first introduced by Brian Haycock to resensitize the muscles to more growth. And these are all targeting this hypothetical mechanism of myonuclei donation. Now, what happens is that when you train, you acquire more muscle nuclei. And while the actual muscle fibers you build up are highly dependent on the chronic and acute training stimulus, so if you train and train more over time, the fibers will grow or at least not shrink. But if you stop training, the muscle fibers will decondition and eventually shrink up. However, there is some good evidence that the muscle nuclei will stay intact for a pretty long time, even after you stop training. In fact, there is some evidence showing that they are permanently there once they have been acquired which is one thing that helps explaining the notion of muscle memory, for example, which is the ability to regain muscle which has once been built up much faster and easier than it was upon building it up the first place. So one thing that Menno and Jacob were discussing in this episode I referred to earlier was that people who use performance enhancing drugs obviously create a much more anabolic environment in the body, which through a variety of mechanisms will allow you to build a lot more muscle than you otherwise could. And so when people stop taking steroids, they will typically lose a good chunk of the extra muscle that, that they have been able to build up due to their use of gear. However, it seems like many of them still end up looking bigger than people who have been naturals their whole life. And one potential explanation is that they, through their steroid use, have been able to acquire more muscle nuclei. And while they do lose a lot of muscle when they get off the gear, 
these cell powering agents, these muscle nuclei are still there intact, which allows them then to build more muscle than they otherwise could have. So how does this tie into the concept of permabulking? Well, the general concept is that one of the few things you can do naturally that could enable you to hold onto more muscle than you could otherwise is being at a higher body fat percentage. A few anecdotes that support this are the fact that obese people usually have a higher lean body mass than leaner people with the same training status. In fact, the highest amounts of lean body masses have been observed amongst sumo wrestlers. It's also well illustrated by the notion that well-trained guys who diet down to very lean levels of body fat will almost always end up with a lower eventual body weight than they would predict initially. So I guess you can see where I'm going with this. If you can hold onto more muscle when you're fat, and if it seems like once you had more muscle at one point, you'll be more likely to hold onto more muscle later as well because of the acquired muscle nuclei, it is perhaps conceivable that by being at a higher body fat percentage, you can permanently increase your ability to carry more muscle because you'll have increased your muscle nuclei domain further than you otherwise could have. So one potential thing that might be worth trying out is to do a really extended bulk and not cutting it off as soon as you normally would. So maybe at the point where you start losing some definition at 15 or so percent body fat, but actually keep going up to as high as 20 or 22 percent body fat. Now, that is the general theory. But then obviously there are a couple of caveats to discuss on this note. But first, let's get into some anecdotes that could support the validity of this whole concept. For one, if you look at almost all of the guys who have built respectable physiques, almost all of them had one period when they were at higher body fat percentages, which by itself doesn't necessarily mean anything. I mean, correlation is not causation, and it might be that they ended up looking great despite of what they have done, but still, almost all of them have this one period from their past, which they tend to reflect to when they were a bit fatter than what perhaps seems reasonable in hindsight. And I'll use the example of Eric Helms, who, no disrespect to him, but he is commonly referred to, even by his own account, as someone who has modest genetics for the sport of bodybuilding, at least. So he is not like a Jeff Alberts, who has pretty much been built to have an aesthetic-looking musculature. So he, when he did his first show in 2007, I believe he was 24 at the time, he actually stepped on stage at, I believe, 178 pounds at six foot at around seven or eight percent body fat, which would put his FFMI somewhere between 22 and 22.5, which for a guy who has been training for a few years and doesn't have the greatest muscle building genetics and probably... I mean, at the time, it's likely that his training wasn't as good as it could have been. He was still in his bro years. It is a very respectable weight to be at when you're at 7 or 8% body fat. Now, what this tells us is that, well, for one, is that his genetics are probably not as modest as you would think. And secondly, it could tell you that his early periods of permabulking, when he was just being a bro, ate a lot and trained, did help him, or at least didn't hurt him. For what it's worth, I can also tell you that so far in my training journey, whenever I hit a new muscular PR, it was almost always also correlated with me hitting some higher body fat percentages previously. In my beginner years, when I put on my first few kilos of muscle, after which I at least looked like I somewhat lifted, sometimes at least, I have put on some body fat before, and in 2017, before hitting a new lean body mass PR, I had also climbed up to maybe 17, 18% body fat before that, which at the time, unfortunately, also coincided with the peak of my disordered eating periods, but at least some positive came out of that eventually, because when I stripped all the fat off, I was at a new muscular personal record, if you will. Now again, how much these results can be attributed to going up to a higher body fat percentage and how much of it can be just attributed to just simply not starving and training enough, it's hard to tell. But nevertheless, it's an interesting anecdote that most people who have built up impressive physiques have at least a couple of dreamer bulking periods under their belt. Now, how can you put all of this info into use? That is the critical question, and that's where we need to address a couple of massive caveats. 
For one, we need to bring ourselves back to the grounds of reality, because what many people will instinctively think when they hear that there might be some benefit from going up to a higher body fat percentage is that sweet, now I have the permission to blow up my diet, start eating pizza and ice cream, be in a 1500 calorie surplus per day, good eating habits out the window, discipline out the window, YOLO eating for the win. And uh, no, <laughs> no. Or actually, maybe, potentially, because if you carry more muscle mass when you're fatter, period, then maybe you can just get fatter, stay there, train there, gain muscle there, and over time also retain more muscle. But I would say that what probably makes more sense, given all the anecdotal and theoretical evidence, is that you slowly go up in body fat, eking out the maximal attainable muscle mass at every stage of the process, so that you only spend as much time at these higher body fat percentages as you quote need to, if you indeed want to give this strategy a go. So ideally, what this process would look like in practice is a disciplined, not rushed gaining phase, which you would normally embark on to go from say 9% body fat to 12% body fat, where you're always making sure that you're not spilling over into too much fat gain, and this same process will now get extended into a much longer bulk. So instead of going from 8% body fat to 12% body fat in four months, you might go from 8% body fat to 22% body fat in 14 months. So the rate of weight gain still shouldn't really change because the concept that you can't force feed gains still applies. So it's important to clarify that this is not a license to start binging. On the other hand, if you approach your diet and bulk with this mindset, it can give you a bit of a peace of mind in that if you fuck up your bulk a little bit and go from 9% body fat to 13% body fat a little too quickly, so you planned on taking it real slow and go up there in say three months, and instead you go up there in one month, you don't necessarily need to freak out that, oh my God, now I only have so much to bulk before I get to 15% body fat, I'm wasting away my bulk. Because you can say, you know what, I'll take it nice and slow from here and go from 13% body fat up to 20 in another seven to eight months. Now, this sounds plenty good and perhaps even logical in theory, but keep in mind that in practice, it's pretty damn hard to do this. So let's say now it's October, you finished your summer of walking around in your tight t-shirts at 9% body fat or whatever, and now you decide to slowly bulk up to 20% body fat over time. What that will mean if you want to do this right is that you will spend at the very least the next 10 months, but possibly even 15 or even 20 months slowly gaining. So you might as well just forget about walking around with a shredded six pack next summer. It will also mean that by the time you see your abs blurring out and you don't really like the way you look like in the mirror, you'll still be eating in a surplus and acquiring fat mass slowly over time. So whereas normally, as you'd get to the point where you're like, okay, I'm pretty soft now, I'd like to cut and clean up the mess a little bit, you'll be like, I'm pretty soft now, and now I'll get even softer. And when you're at that point, you'll have a lot of those moments of, man, I look like shit anyway, so who cares now, I'll just start YOLOing things. But no, you still need to be disciplined, and you still don't want to gain more than like 200 grams of tissue weight per week. So psychologically, it's way more difficult to push this through than in theory. Now, if you're not overly vain, if you don't have, for example, a business like Key Nobody or something, which is predicated on you being shredded and lean all the time, then you could actually do it. And in reality, even the shredded abs in the summer thing, I mean, I, for example, this summer exactly had one week when I was half naked a good portion of the time when I was in Greece. And even then, nobody would have given a shit if I was 20% body fat instead of 10. So it's not really that big of an issue, but still, it can be hard on your mind. Now, there are a few other issues here, one being the dreaded P ratio. So as you may know, it became more and more of a commonly talked about concept in fitness circles that as you get fatter, the less muscle you're going to build and you'll just preferentially store more body fat because of reduced insulin sensitivity, higher levels of systemic inflammation, and some other ugly concepts like that. And I kind of feel like this is a topic that has gotten so exhausted on my channel before that I don't even really want to address it. But the long story short on this is that 
it is by no means as clear as many people make it out to be that beyond 15% body fat, you will just gain more fat and not as much muscle. And this concept has largely been extrapolated by a few studies in which either obese, non-exercising people were studied or slightly overweight, non-exercising people were studied. And there is no actual evidence that otherwise healthy, intensely training people being at, say, 20% body fat would build less muscle than a similar population at, say, 10% body fat. And if you want to hear about this in really great detail, I'd recommend the bulking debate on my channel between Mike Isretel and Eric Helms, where we spent a good chunk of time talking about this topic alone. So I don't want to go into the whole P-ratio thing too much. However, there might be a good rationale to think that being leaner is just healthier than being higher in body fat. So for example, as you're gaining more fat, you'll also gain more visceral fat, which is associated with some pretty bad stuff and just a lot of health markers and different biomarkers of aging, levels of systemic inflammation and the like might be just better when you're at the leaner side. So from purely a health and anti-aging perspective, it might be better to stay leaner. I myself notice, for example, that as I'm approaching about 15% body fat, I get more acne. I just notice a few things that I don't really want to go into detail here that are indicative that my health is just not being as pristine as it could be or it should be. Now, another thing which I think is just interesting from a teleological perspective is to just observe the primary population who advocates against going too high in body fat and the primary population who gets really good at staying lean. And they tend to be advanced trainees who unquestionably do a much better job at staying lean, but you could also say they're also the ones not growing anymore. <laughs> now, obviously, this is not to say that they could grow a whole bunch if they just dreamer bulked as a beginner would, but maybe in that case, they would have more of a chance, so to speak. But of course, it's important to note that this kind of a mindset does make a lot more sense for them. So if we're talking about some guy who is a fitness influencer of sorts and is, say, at 5'11 or a meter 80 and is at 82 kilos or 182 pounds at 10% body fat, looks awesome. He posts his pics on Instagram, which is great for his business. It gets him a lot of engagement, attracts a lot of customers. Would it make sense for him to go on a year and a half long bulk, go up to 20% body fat in the hopes that he may be able to gain an additional, even as much as five pounds of muscle? I mean, five pounds of muscle is a very impressive gain in a year and a half for a very advanced guy, but is it really worth it for him to spend a year not being satisfied with his looks, not being able to post his latest pics on Instagram to generate more engagement, when at the end of it, most people probably won't even notice that extra five pounds of gains spread out all over his body? Probably not. So again, it largely comes down to what your goals are. If you're like most of us who just want to look good naked, progress over time so that you can have fitness as a side asset of your life, then, you know, just find that body fat range sweet spot where you feel good, have good workouts, good cognition, and you like how you look like in the mirror, and just hover around that range, and you'll probably still make good progress over time. Now, if you view this as a personal challenge and almost view your fitness as a computer game where you're testing how much progress you can eke out, then it might be worth your while to experiment with this. Just note that it will be hard. And what I'm afraid of is that for a lot of guys with sort of a very impulsive mentality, this will just lead to some massive overeating periods and then freak out that, oh my God, I'm getting fat, then starting to cut and just being back at the same permacutting and overeating cycle, which I talked about on my channel at Nauseam. So that's the conclusion on permabulking. If you have the discipline and the ease of mind, you might find some benefit from it but it's important to view it in its right context and to realize that this is not a get-out-of-jail-free card that gives you the license to kick all of your good eating habits on their head. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode and liked what you heard. And if you did, then I think you'd definitely love our SSD training and nutritional course that we recently put out with Burge Fagerli. This program not only contains a 12-week phasic training program that you can use to time efficiently and safely build the best body you can, but also gives you four plus hours of video lectures about managing your nutrition and lifestyle to not only look good, but feel and perform optimally. And besides this, you will also be getting some 
really awesome bonuses like Burger Fagerly's Myo Reps and Zero Carb ebook. So if this sounds interesting to you, then go ahead and check out sustainableselfdevelopment.com. And of course, to not miss out on future episodes like this, subscribe to the podcast and you'll be up to date on everything we'll be putting out. So thank you for hanging around up until now and see you next time.